Let's pray. Well, Father, I just pray, Lord, that um, that would even become the heart of our prayer uh, today. If I have you and nothing else, then I have everything. Lord, help me to present this message to the Lord the way you've put it on my heart. And Lord, help it to fall on ears that are ready to hear, ready to listen, and ready to move according to what you've called us to do. God, we love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I heard about this uh, little boy. He was probably only about eight years old, little bitty guy. And uh, he goes into a grocery store, and he goes in the back, and he goes right to the laundry detergent soap, and he finds this biggest box of laundry detergent that he could possibly find. And he grabs that box of laundry detergent, and he can barely even carry it. And he's practically dragging it up to the counter, you know. And, and the, uh, the grocery clerk, he looks at him and says, Sir, could he said, son, can I help you with that? And he said, no, sir. He said, I'll get it. And he said, man, he goes, that's an awful lot of laundry detergent. He said, uh, what's your plans with that? He said, you got a lot of laundry to do? And he said, well, no, sir. He said, I don't have any laundry to do. He said, I'm going to wash my dog. And he said, you're going to wash your dog? He said, son, he said, he, he goes, I wouldn't recommend that. He said, I wouldn't wash your dog with that. He said, if you wash your dog with that, he said, it could make your dog really sick. And he said, it might even kill your dog. And uh, the little boy, his mind was just made up. He said, no, I'm going to do it. And he wasn't going to be talked out of it. And he went all the way up there. He paid for it. And he, and he went home and he just had his mind made up that he was going to do this. And there wasn't a single thing anybody was going to say to stop him from doing it. Well, about a week or so later, he comes back and he's buying a couple pieces of candy from the grocer. And the grocer looked at him and he said, son, he said, how's your dog doing? And the little boy looked at him and shook his head and he said, oh, he died. And he said, he died? He said, you know, he goes, I'm not trying to say I told you so, but he said, I told you not to wash your dog with that detergent that it might even kill him. And the little boy looked at him and said, well, I don't think the detergent killed him. And he said, oh, he said, what was it? And the little boy said, I think it was the spin cycle. <laughs> Okay, as I said for the first service, for all you animal lovers out there, <laughs> I even had a lady tell me she was mad at me when she left. I think she was kidding. She had a grandma. But for all you animal lovers out there, this was not a true story. This was not a true story, so do not try that at home. Uh, it wasn't a true story, and no animals were harmed in the telling of that joke, right? However, that joke perfectly illustrates how we operate our life. We operate our life in this kind of mentality so often. Do you know how many times in my life uh, that I was given advice that I didn't listen to? So many times I was warned to do this or not to do this. And I lived my life in a way that, you know what, I didn't want to li uh, listen to anybody's advice. I refused to follow direction because, you know what, I had my mind made up. I had my mind made up and I was going to do things my way and I was going to figure out the hard way. Well, guess what? I did. I figured out the hard way on several things that I do. In fact, sometimes I still continue to learn the hard way. But that's not my intention. But earlier on in life, I didn't want to listen. And unfortunately, you know, just like... Just like there's a better way to wash a dog, there's a better way of doing most of the things that we do in life. Can I get an amen? There's a better way of doing most of the things that we do in our life. And that's why we need the Word of God. That's why we need the Word of God in our life, because the Word of God helps us. The Word of God helps us, it leads us, it guides us, it encourages us, it even corrects us, and it gives us wisdom, and it shows us that there's a better way of doing the things that we do in our life. Can I get another amen? Why do we learn the hard way? Why do we learn the hard way in the things that we do? We're going to continue our journey through the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon series, we've titled it, A Better Way. And then throughout this whole series, I encourage you, if you've missed any of them, go online and check it out and try to get updated because Jesus challenges us. Man, he challenges us in so many different ways. He challenges us right, right out of the chute in the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. The very word Beatitudes, when he talks about blessed are the poor, blessed are the humble, when he goes through all that, the very word blessed means approved by God. He's showing us as disciples of Christ how we can be lifelong students that gets his approval. And you know, as a disciple of Christ, as a Christian, we should want the approval of God. Amen? And that's what he shows us. So he challenges us throughout the Beatitudes in so many different ways, how we can live a, a lifelong life of being approved by him. And then he challenges us in different ways. He moves on to talking about how we can be different in the world that we live in and how we're supposed to be salt and light in this world. And the reason why we're supposed to be different 
is because he wants your lost family members. He wants the people that you work with that don't know Jesus. He wants the people that we come across in school and on a regular day basis. He wants them to know him. So if we're not salt and light, if we're not making people uh, crave Jesus, if we're not looking any different, then people aren't going to know him. So he challenges us to be different and be in salt and light. And then you know what? Jesus goes on from there if he hasn't stepped on our toes enough and he moves in and he gives us a clear picture when it comes to murder, when it comes to anger, when it comes to adultery, when it comes to lust, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to divorce, when it comes to revenge, when it comes to forgiveness, when it comes to going the extra mile, when it comes to keeping our promises, when it comes to people being being people of integrity. And then last week we found out that he challenged us in the, uh, in the spiritual disciplines when it comes to giving and praying and fasting. And he tells us, you know what, our motives matter. So whatever it is that we do, make sure we do it with the right heart, right? Let's not do the right thing the wrong way. So he just keeps pushing everything towards our heart. He keeps trying to show us a different way of doing things. Guys, listen, it's critical that we do the right thing the right way. And it's also critical that we understand that the Sermon on the Mount, you know what, the messages that we preached on and we've talked about, they're kind of hard to swallow some of them, aren't they? Has anybody been challenged through any of them to see things differently? I know I have, and I know a lot of the messages has been hard to swallow. As I sit down and I study it, and I look at it, and I say, God, how does this apply to me? Because see, guys, I don't just get up here and just try to preach a message that's going to push your guys' buttons. I preach a message as God shows, and I say, God, what do you want to do in my own life? Because I'm not perfect. I haven't arrived. So you know what? He can teach me a thing or two about lust, about uh, revenge, about having the right thing and the right motives and the right thing. Don't you think we can all be learners? So even though some of this has been hard, even though some of this has been tough. I want us to understand that the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus is not trying to be a cosmic killjoy. Okay? That's not his intention. He's not trying to, you know what, just suck all the fun out of life and just be a party pooper. He's not trying to do that. He's not trying to give us a bunch of impossible rules to follow. He's not trying to make us feel worthless. He's not trying to make us to feel unworthy. He's not trying to give us this big heavy yoke that's impossible to have. In fact, can I tell you, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. He's not trying to make us uh, uh, put a heavy load on us. Listen to what Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30 says. These are the words of Jesus. Jesus says this. He says, come to me all who are weary and burdened. Anybody ever feel like you're weary and burdened sometime? Can I tell you where we get that wearisome and that burden? It's from carrying around the yoke of the world. The world, when we try to do things our way, like that young boy picking up the detergent, when we try to just refuse to listen to a way, we end up making one bad decision after another, and we end up living our lives carrying around this extra load and this extra burden, this extra, and, and we, we have all this unnecessary pressure on our life. And Jesus says, I did not come, I did not come to me all who are weary and burdened. He says, I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Listen, guys, Jesus doesn't want to bog us down. He actually wants to remove our load by giving us a better way of doing things that produces better results. Can I get an amen? amen. Don't you want a better way of doing things? I am tired of hitting that brick wall and doing the same things in life that causes terrible results. Well, guess what? He wants to show us a better way, and, can I, and he challenges us by doing it in the Sermon on the Mount. And can I tell you that today's message is going to be no different? Today's message is going to be no different. He's going to challenge us today in the area of our possessions. He's going to challenge us today in the area of our generosity. And he's going to challenge us in the area of our money. Now, some of you might be thinking right now, oh boy, here we go again. Man, that ain't preaching, that's meddling. Right? Can I tell you something? Can I tell you that every area of my life that I've let God meddle in, that I've let God get in the middle of, can I tell you it's a much better way doing it his way? So you can call it meddling, you can call it preaching, you can call it whatever it is that Jesus is doing, but I call it truth. I call it truth, and God wants us to understand a much better way of doing things. I heard a preacher say this one time. He said, Sermon on, sermons on giving are a lot like root canals. They might be a little painful, but they are necessary and helpful. So you know what? Lean back, get ready for a root canal. Amen? Everybody excited about a root canal today? <laughs> it's how we want to look at it, right? It's how we want to look at it. Let's look at it as truth and understand 
understand that God wants to show us a better way when it comes to this area. Guys, I believe the reason why we are so touchy when it comes to this area, I believe that we are so touchy because oftentimes, and here's the deal, you can write this down, and I believe this beyond a shadow of a doubt, oftentimes, instead of us possessing our possessions, our possessions possess us. Instead of us possessing our possessions, our possessions possess us. And can I tell you, when they do, it really puts an unnecessary yoke on us. It puts an unnecessary load upon us to carry. You want to know why? It's because we become slaves to stuff. We become slaves to stuff and we become slaves to, our almi to the almighty dollar. We become slaves to our mortgage payment. We become slaves to our credit card payment. We become slaves to our car payment. We become slaves to our spouse's car payment, our kids' car payment, and the extra car payment we have just in case we need another vehicle to drive. We become slaves to our camper, our four-wheeler, and our boat payments. We become slaves to uh, the cost of our children's activities we become slaves to the cost of our hobbies and we become slaves to every other things that speaks for the money that we earn can anybody relate to that we become slaves don't we we become slaves and we work for the dollar and we work for the possessions guys I can tell you this I believe I, I believe that we've kind of got it mixed up I'm afraid that we become a society that is allowing the ta tail to wag the dog instead of the dog to wag the tail We've let our finances control us, and we become slaves to it. Jesus wants us to understand, guys, our money and our possessions, they are not owned, but they are loaned. Our money and our possessions, they're not owned. We don't own anything. They're not ours. They're loaned from God. But see, we don't think that. We think that this mine, 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 mine. But it's on a loan. And God says, you know what? We need to be good stewards of what God's given us. We need to be good stewards of what he's given us, our resources. And guys, can I tell you, when we realize this truth, when we realize it's all God's anyway, can I tell you, it's the most freeing thing in the world for a believer. Because money chokes you. It absolutely chokes you and we become slaves to it. So if you're ready to hear from God, open up your Bible to Matthew 6, 19 through 24. And that's where we're going to find our passage today. Matthew 6, 19 through 24. And we're going to learn how we can shift our focus in this area and discover a better way of investing in our future. Follow along with me in this scripture. And in this passage, Jesus gives us three examples. He gives us three examples when it comes to our investment. Starting in verse 19, he says this. He says, Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not... For where your treasure is... There your heart will be also. And then in verse 22, he goes on to another illustration. And he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, then your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And then in verse 24, he gives us our final illustration. He says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. So the first thing that we need to understand when it comes to investing in our future, is number uh, prior or is number Roman number number one is to prioritize your treasures. Prioritize your treasures. You know what Jesus commands us in verses nineteen through twenty one to prioritize our earthly treasures over our earthly stuff. But unfortunately, sometimes we put our earthly stuff above our heavenly treasures. We kind of get things out of whack sometime. And he says that, you know what? We need, to, we need to switch it back around and do what his intention. Let me ask you a question. Does anybody have any earthly stuff? Anybody got any earthly stuff? Let me tell you about my earthly stuff. You know, I'm sitting down writing this message and thinking about it and praying about it, and God started revealing to me all the stuff that I have. You don't even realize how much stuff you have until you start thinking about it. If you come over to my house and that garage door's open, I tell you what, you're going to see this garage completely full of stuff. All the shelves are full of stuff. you got stuff stacked up on the ground. In fact, I've got so much stuff that I'm thinking about building more shelves so I can put more stuff in there that I'm never going to use so I can have more stuff. But then you walk 
walk into our house and we sit on stuff. We have stuff sitting on stuff that we own. You go into our closets. Our closets are completely full of stuff. Under the beds are full of stuff. In the attic's full of stuff. We got stuff. Amen? Can you relate? I think you guys are probably no different than me, right? You guys got stuff. We all got stuff. And if we think about all the stuff we re have, we realize what we have. You know, according to what verse 19 says, Jesus tells us this. He says, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth, a bunch of earthly stuff, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. That kind of sounds like just the opposite of what we just all admitted to, right? He tells us not to get so focused on all that stuff and not to build it up. Listen to this, guys. Let's look into this a little bit deeper. The word used here for store up and the word for treasure that he uses actually comes from the same root word. So Jesus is literally saying this. He's saying, do not treasure for yourself treasures. That's what he's saying. He's saying, do not treasure for yourself treasures. In other words, don't be so focused on stockpiling a bunch of earthly stuff that you lose track on what's truly important. That's what he's saying. Don't be so focused about accumulating all this stuff that we end up still in our focus away from what's truly important, and that is building God's kingdom. Okay? So does that mean we shouldn't have nice stuff? Does that mean we shouldn't have nice stuff? Does that mean we shouldn't have nice houses? Does that mean we shouldn't have nice cars? Does it mean that we shouldn't bother with having a savings account? Does it mean that we shouldn't invest in retirement or plan for the future? Does it mean that we shouldn't uh, put a little money away for tough times? Does it mean that we shouldn't put a little money away for fun times so we don't have to tap into the credit cards? Can I tell you, I don't believe that that's what Jesus is talking about. I don't believe that Jesus is saying that you can't have anything. I think the Bible is very clear when it comes to saving money and providing for the family. I think you can see all kinds of scriptures that Jesus says, you know what, we should save money. We should provide for our family, not just now, but also in the future, right? We're supposed to leave our children a heritage. We're supposed to uh, provide for them now and for also later. We also see in scripture that the Apostle Paul even indicates that we can enjoy what the Lord has given us. So I don't believe that that's what Jesus is talking about. I believe that Jesus is talking about stockpiling treasures on here here on earth for selfish motives for selfish reasons to have all this stuff accumulating when we put our focus on all this stuff it takes our focus off of what God can do with us if we build the kingdom of God he wants us to have the right attitude has anybody had the uh, seen the bumper sticker with the attitude of whoever wins with the most toys wins or whoever dies with the most toys wins that's what he's talking about it's having the wrong attitude when it comes to accumulating stuff listen guys Jesus doesn't want us to be so focused on our earthly bank account that our heavenly bank account is bankrupt. He doesn't want us so focused on our earthly bank account, our earthly stuff, while we're sitting here with our heavenly bank account broke. I wonder today how many people in here have a really fat earthly bank account, but they've not earned anything when it comes to their heavenly bank account. See, we've got to get our priorities in the right place. Amen? That's what Jesus is saying here. Let's have the right focus. Jesus wants us to prioritize our treasures. He wants us to invest in something that's going to last forever and not just something that's temporal. You see, in Jesus' day, you know what? Bank accounts didn't exist. They couldn't walk across the street or go down to the local bank and put money in there. They didn't exist. So Jesus actually illustrates three, three temporal ways that people would accumulate wealth. The first way that Jesus addresses here is people would collect clothes. They would collect clothes. You know what? If they had a closet full of nice clothes, it was as good as money in the bank. Because these people would stockpile clothes, they would accumulate all this clothing, and then they would end up selling it in the future. Let me ask you a question. How many of you today have stockpiled clothes? <laughs> right? I guarantee you, with the seven people in my family, if you would go over to my house, we've got more clothes than we know what to do with. Each one of us. I guarantee we got more clothes, more shoes. How, how many shoes do you need for how many different outfits, right? Depends on whether it's before Labor Day or after Labor Day or whatever all that stuff is. But we got more clothes than we possibly know what to do with. We got so much clothes in our closets, we probably have stuff that we haven't ever wore before. And if we have, maybe we've worn it once or twice and maybe never again. You know what? I've been over to Africa and I've been over to Haiti and I've seen little children, I've seen adults, I've seen them run around with the same, same pair of clothes day after, day in, day out because it's all they own is the shirt on their back and the clothes that they have. A lot of times missionaries will go over there and they'll bring a suit plate case full of clothes and they'll leave the clothes and come back empty handed. You know, for us, we don't realize that we're stockpiling clothes. We don't realize that we have all this. But to somebody that has nothing, 
we got more clothes than we know what to do with. You know, we might not take them and, and sell them, you know, and make money later on. But you know what? Maybe that new outfit that we're going to buy, maybe that could have went towards investing in the kingdom instead of investing into us looking good. Can I get an amen? You know, Jesus said the problem with this, the problem with this is, you know what? It's not going to last. Because, see, the people in this day, they didn't have, you know, um, they didn't have mothballs. They didn't have cedar-lined closets. And guess what would end up happening when they'd stockpile all these clothes? Guess what would happen? Just what Jesus said in verse 19. He said the moths are going to get in there. The moths are going to get in there, and they're going to eat holes in the garments, and they're going to destroy it. So you're focusing all this money, all this time, all this energy in something that's not going to last. It's temporal. And then Jesus moves on, and he gives us another uh, way. You know, another way of accumulating wealth at this time was to store grain in barns because the famines was always a reality in this area because of the undependable rains. So what people would do if they could, they would store up all this grain and then when famine would hit they would uh, and grain prices would soar, they would sell their grain to become unbelievably wealthy. And in verse 19, uh, Jesus addresses this problem and he says, you know what, the only problem with that, it's nothing wrong with doing it, but the problem is when you put all that in there, you know what, it's not dependable either because guess what can come in there? The vermins can come in there and eat it. They can come in there and they can destroy it. Some versions of the Bible might say we're rough destroys. Your version might say rust. But the actual word, the Greek word used here comes from the word brosis, B-R-O-S-I-S, -S, which conveys the act of eating. So most likely the translation means that he's talking about rats or mites or roaches or termites. They'd get in there and they'd eat the grain. And Jesus was just simply saying this, be careful about investing all your attention in accumulating wealth that can be destroyed and won't last forever. And then the third way that he shows us, he gives us this one final example and he, uh, and he talks about the method of of exchanging assets for gold. That's another way they would accumulate wealth. They would exchange their assets for gold, and then the people of this day, they would actually bury their gold under their house floor. Guys, guess what? Their houses didn't look like us. You know, you're probably not going to dig a hole in your house floor. But back there in this day, they were made of baked clay, so they had dirt floors. So when they would get gold, they would dig down and they would bury their gold and they would cover it back up. Well, guess what would happen? When they weren't home, thieves would break in. Thieves would break in and they would dig a hole in the middle of the house, in the wall of the house, and they would get in there and they would steal whatever that you had. And they know how to look for it and they would carry everything away. In fact, the thieves in that day were even called diggers. That's what they referred to was they were diggers because they would dig into the side of your house and they would rob you blind. Thieves would get still anything they got their hands on. You know the Gutch Halls, Angie and Bill Gutch Hall and Cole, and you know they uh, they experienced this sad truth this morning. You know they got a phone call at 3 a.m. this morning. And they asked if Cole's truck was at home, uh, their truck at home. And they said, well, we're assuming it was. And they looked out, and his truck was gone. Guess what happened? His truck was stolen in the middle of the night. And the person that stole it was actually involved in a high-speed chase as the cops were chasing him. They went yard farming. They absolutely tore his truck up. You know, that's a terrible story, and my heart breaks for Cole. It breaks for you guys. But it still illustrates the story perfectly that nothing is safe that we have. You understand that? Nothing is safe. And that's the point that Jesus was trying to make here. The point was this. In all three of these examples, Jesus was not running down having possessions. He wasn't running down making money. He wasn't running down planning for the future. So don't walk out of here thinking that's what I'm saying. But he was trying to get us to be disciples that understand that no matter what kind of wealth you have, no matter how hard you try to protect it, eventually it will be gone because earthly treasures are perishable and they're vulnerable and you have no idea what could happen so if we spend an entire lifetime completely focused on accumulating wealth for selfish purposes only for selfish reasons only then it's no different than investing in a company's uh, stock the day they declare bankruptcy Jesus is saying it's a sure deal it won't last that's all he's trying to get us to do. He's trying to understand, he's trying to get us to understand the focus and where we put our priorities. And then Jesus goes on to say this. He says, you know what? I got a better way. I got a better way of investing in the future, and it's a way that'll last forever. In verse 20, Jesus says this. He says, but to store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moss and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Can I tell you, this is one of the clearest scriptures in all the Bible that's concerning earthly or heavenly rewards. This is one of the clearest scriptures concerning eternal rewards. The word store up here is the Greek word for and it's a command and it's also a present tense meaning this. Jesus is, Jesus is, is commanding us to make storing up treasures in heaven our focus of our everyday life. 
It's something that we need to constantly strive for. It's investing in God's kingdom. It's investing in other people. It's not letting, it's not that nice things aren't okay to have. It's don't let them control you. It's don't let them run you. You know, we need to be uh, focused on investing into others and investing into building his kingdom. You want to know why? Because it glorifies God. It glorifies God. When we invest into God's kingdom, it glorifies him. And he wants us to keep and enjoy our treasures forever and ever and ever. Don't you want your treasures to last forever? He says when we invest in his kingdom, they'll last forever. And since heaven is the only place your treasures will be uh, safe, he commands us to store it up for your good and for his glory. But you know what the biggest problem is that we face with our treasures? The biggest problem that we face with our treasures is we want an immediate gratification. Isn't that right? That outfit makes me look good though, right? And that car I drive makes me look good. We want an immediate gratification from our treasures. We want things, uh, we want to spend our money on something that we can receive right now, something we can see right now, something that we can have right now, something that we can enjoy right now, and investing in our eternal rewards, you know what, it's different. Because it might be something that we don't experience right now. It might be something we don't experience right now, we can't see them right now, we can't have them right now. It's a delayed gratification. Let me give you something to think about for just a moment. Suppose each one of you today, I gave $1,000 to you today on your way out and said you can have it to spend any way that you want. Would you think that you had the best pastor in town? <laughs> Come on now, if I gave you $1,000, would you think you had the best pastor in town? Every single one of you would like that, right? But what if I told you this? Okay, you could have $1,000 right now today to invest however you wanted. However, if you left the $1,000 and you walked away from it, then I'd give you $10 million a year from today. And I'd give you $10 million every year following. Would you take the $1,000 today or would you wait? You'd wait, wouldn't you? Most of us would. I couldn't imagine anybody taking that $1,000 today for that. Guys, here's the deal. This is what we do every single day when we focus our life completely on accumulating stuff selfishly that's only going to last for a moment. Jesus says, you know what? I've got something so much better. It's a delayed gratification. You might have to wait just a little bit, but man, it's going to last forever. It's going to last so much longer, and there's so much more value. And then Jesus says, whatever your treasure is, um, what, whatever, whatever, uh, whatever your treasure you spend your life focusing on, there your heart will be also. Jesus ends this command by saying in verse 20, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, if some of us wrote this, including myself, we'd probably flip that around. We would probably flip that around where it read, where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. Because we have a tendency of thinking this. We have a tendency of thinking that the most important thing that we have is that we feel good about doing something before we do it. And you know what? If we feel good about it doing it, then we'll do it. And if we don't feel good about it, then we're not going to do it. And we stop that. But you know what? Jesus said it actually works just the opposite. He said it works just about the opposite. In fact, Everything that he said has been completely opposite of what the way that I think. But he says it's just the opposite. He says when you invest your time, your money, your energy in the right thing, then your affections are going to follow your investment. He's telling us that our emotions will follow our motions. In fact, motions create emotions. Interest creates, or investment creates interest. So based on what Jesus is saying here, he's saying one of the first steps to investing in eternal future is to do something for his kingdom with the right attitude, even if emotionally you don't want to. Even if you're not just sold on the fact, you know what, if you step out and you do it with the right heart, you know what, you're going to find out that giving's fun. You're going to find out that investing into other people's fun. You're going to find out when somebody's short 20 bucks and I give him 20 bucks, it's fun. You're going to figure out when somebody has a flat tire and you know what, they can't afford a new tire and you can and you do that, it's fun. You're going to figure out that, that washing machine that you have in your garage that you don't use but you just have there and somebody's breaks down and I give them that to it, that it's fun. You know, you might be sitting here thinking, you know, I know I should but emotionally I'm just not there because I feel like I need to let go of this. Jesus says, you know what, if you wait till your emotions tell you to do something, you'll never do it. Don't wait for your heart to be right. Just step out with the right attitude. And when you do, your emotions will follow. Your emotions will follow. That's why Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if I'm giving my treasures to other people, I'm going to understand I like this. And guess what? My excitement and my emotions will follow me. 
Don't wait for you to feel good about something. You know what? Maybe Jesus, maybe God's telling you to step out and start tithing. Maybe he's telling you to give extra to the building fund. Maybe he's telling you to give to a ministry. Maybe he's telling you to start a ministry. Maybe he's telling you to invest into other people. But whatever it is, don't wait for your heart to tell you to move. Just move. Start putting your treasures in the right place. And guess what? Your heart's going to follow. Your heart's going to follow. Jesus said if you want to invest into your future in a way that will last forever, number one, prioritize your... Uh, prioritize your treasures. And number two, on your outline, don't be stingy, but instead be generous. Don't be stingy, but instead be generous. In these next few verses here, we see that generosity breeds light, while stinginess breeds darkness. Let's read 22 and 23 again. Jesus says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, I'll be honest with you right here. I've read this verse several times, and I had no idea this verse had anything to do with money. None at all. I had no idea it had to do with money. Until I jumped in there, and I started reading it, and I started studying it. And most scholars agree with this. Most scholars agree that the King James Version is the most literal and accurate reading when it comes to the eye. In the King James Version in this, it says, if your eye is single. That's what the King James Version says. It says, if your eye is single, and then it goes on to say, if your eye is evil. By the way, that's where we get the, uh, the word or the impre- or expression evil eye. Ever, anybody ever heard the evil eye? That's where we get, we get a lot of expressions, as I say, every single Sunday from the Sermon on the Mount. But Jesus is referring to the eye that's single and to the eye that's evil. So what in the world does it mean to have a single eye and what does it mean to have an evil eye? First of all, let's think of our culture for just a minute. You know, sometimes we use various expressions concerning the eye and we use various expressions uh, uh, describing maybe a person's physical condition because of the eye. Sometimes we use the word red-eyed. Have you ever heard that before? So when we say that somebody's red-eyed, we might be considered them to be tired. If we use dreamy-eyed, then it might be considered somebody's in love. If we use the word sharp-eyed, it might be somebody that's crafty. If we use the word cockeyed, it might be somebody with a distorted view of reality. If we use the word bug-eyed, it might be somebody that's surprised. Do you get the drift in what I'm saying? That's what's going on here in this speech. So similar to this, the Old Testament uses several references where people are single-eyed. The Old Testament refers to several instances where the people are single-eyed. And being single-eyed refers to a person that is generous. That's what it means. If you're considered to have a single eye, then that means that you are a generous person. So when Jesus uses this language here, he's referring to a person who gives to others with an open-hearted generosity. And the warm heart shines through his warm eyes. That's what it means to be single-eyed. It means that you're a generous person. Well, guess what? The opposite is true of the evil eye. The opposite is true of the evil eye. Someone that had an evil eye was somebody that was considered stingy and begrudging and had a begrudging spirit. They were clouded by God greed and selfishness that resulted in darkness in every area of a person's life. Have you ever met somebody that was greedy? It's not a good thing, does it? And it makes every area of their life completely dark. That's what Jesus is talking about. If you have an evil eye, you're ate up with greediness and it just covers every area of your eye. Listen to this, guys. The same speech, the same, uh, the same wordage was used in the parable of the generous vineyard. Do you remember that parable? Does anybody remember that? In this parable, Jesus, uh, the, the vineyard, he hires some guys early in the morning. And he says, hey, I need you to do this and this job. And throughout the day, he ends up hiring different people throughout the day. And by the end of the day, like an hour before quitting time, he hires some more people. And they end up working. So at the end of the day, he's getting ready to divide up the wages and to give everybody their money. Well, guess what the, 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 uh, the generous uh, landowner did the vineyard owner did he gave everybody the same pay everyone even the people that worked there just an hour got the same pay as people that worked there all day long and guess what the people that worked there from the very beginning of the day happened to them they got mad they got furious and they complained even though they had agreed to work for that amount they were mad because greed had got in there and it took over them and they were very very mad because they wanted more money and they wanted the other people to have less money and in Matthew 20 15 the owner said this he said is your eye evil because I am good Is your eye evil because I am good? These people had an evil eye. 
Jesus makes it clear here in this verse. If you look upon things on this earth with a generous perspective, your life will be useful. However, if you look upon things on this earth from greed in your mind, then you know what? You are absolutely wasting your life. Listen, guys. Generous people, you know what? They give themselves of their money and their time. And you know what? They take care of people that have a need, and the result of that is they experience joy in this life and the life to come because they understand they're building up rewards, not just for here, but for later on in eternity too. So let me ask you a question. If you were facing Jesus right now today, do you think Jesus would consider you to be somebody with a single eye, or do you think he would consider you to be somebody with an evil eye? Are you a generous person or are you a greedy and stingy person? Listen, guys, when we finally grasp and understand heavenly treasures and we understand how God's kingdom works, then you can afford to be generous no matter how much or how little you have because you've got the right heart and you're trying to help people out because you're going to realize that earthly stuff is just temporary, but our generosity will last forever. So in this passage, Jesus tells us to choose between two treasures. He tells us to choose between two eyes. And in the final portion, he tells us to choose between two masters. You see, investing in your future that lasts will require, number three, to put God on the throne of your life. To put God on the throne of your life. Jesus wraps up this portion of his message by telling us that it's impossible to serve both God and wealth. It's impossible. Verse 24 says this, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. You see, back in Jesus' day, a slave owner could actually rent out one of his servants to another taskmaster. To another taskmaster. And the problem that they would have is it would put that servant in a bind. It would put him in a bind. For instance, what if the two men gave him conflicting orders? What if the two men gave them conflicting orders? Who was he supposed to respond to? Who was he supposed to listen to? Let's bring it up into our today's time. Anybody have you ever worked for two supervisors that couldn't be more opposite? Have you ever worked for two, op two uh, supervisors that's given you a job and one tells you to do it this way and the other person tells you to do it this way? Is that frustrating? Is that aggravating? Is it impossible to make both of them happy? You can't, can you? You cannot serve both of them at the same time. It can be very, very frustrating. Well, guess what? The same is true in this sense, but it's on a much larger scale. Listen, guys, we all have a throne in our life. We all have a throne on our life, and it's not big enough for two. It's only big enough for one. So here's the deal. You either have Christ on the throne, or you have money on the throne. It's just that simple. You either have Christ on the throne of your life, or you have money on the throne. But it's impossible to have both of them at the same time. And the reason is simple. is because I believe that money is one of God's number one competitor. Listen to this, guys. God and money are not employers. They're slave owners. God and money are not employers. They're slave owners. And each one demands a single-minded devotion. You can't be full-time slave to two masters. It's completely impossible. Here's the deal. If you serve God with your whole heart, if, God, if you're all in, if you serve God with your whole heart, then the seductive love for money will not control you. If you serve God with your whole heart, then the seductive love for money will not control you. However, just the opposite is true. If you serve the seductive love for money, then it's impossible to serve God with your whole heart. It's your choice. One of them is on the throne. Now, I want you to understand what I'm saying because I want you to have a clear picture of this. Jesus does not say you can't have money. Don't hear me walk out of here and say that money's wrong. In fact, Jesus doesn't even say you can't have a lot of money. You can be extremely wealthy and be a Christian and do things the right way. What Jesus said is you can't serve money. Either money's on the throne or God's on the throne. But when you recognize that it's a kingdom focus, then you're going to look at it differently and that money will not serve you. So let's return back. I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up. Let's return back from what we started with. Do you possess your possessions? Or does your possessions possess you? Do you possess your possessions or do your possessions possess you? Listen, guys, the success of our entire Christian walk really comes down to how you answer this one question. Who is on the throne of your life? Who is on the throne of your life? If God's on the throne, 
then all your focuses, all your priorities, everything will come into place. But guys, if your answer is anything other than God, then you know what? Your focus is in the wrong place. Your focus is in the wrong place, and your priorities will completely be out of order. Somebody posted this article on Facebook this week concerning our priorities, and I thought it was really good. It's entitled, It's Strange. And maybe you've seen it, but I'm going to go ahead and read it today because I believe that we can relate to this. This is what it says. It says, It's strange how $20 can seem like such a large amount when donated to a church, but such a small amount when you go shopping. Isn't that the truth? How many of you have walked out with $20 in a grocery stack and it came to very much? It's strange how two hours seems like a long time when you're in church, but how short it seems when you're watching a good movie. It's strange that you can't find words to say when you're praying, but you have no trouble thinking about what to say when you're with a friend. It's strange how difficult it is to read one chapter of the Bible, but how easy it is to read a popular novel, your favorite magazine, or a daily newspaper. It's strange how everyone wants front row tickets to a concert, but they want to sit in the last row at church. It's strange how we... It's strange how we need to know of an event that the church is having at least two weeks, two to three weeks before that day so we can think about including it on our calendar, but we can adjust our agenda for any other event with just in a few minutes. Isn't that the truth? It's strange how difficult it is to learn a fact about God and then to share it with others, but how easy it is to repeat gossip. It's strange how we believe everything that a magazine and newspaper say, but we question the words in the Bible. Now, they finished right there, but I'm going to add one more because I think they left one out. It's strange how every school, organization, and club we are a part of requires money to operate. And they are not afraid to ask for it. And when we do, we pull out our checkbook and we write a check. However, let a preacher teach on a biblical perspective concerning our money, and we leave mad thinking that the only thing the church wants is their money. Can I get an amen? amen. Who's on the throne of your life? Where's your focus? Where's your priorities? What do they look like? Are you investing in your future? Revelation 22, 12 says this, and these are the words of Jesus. He says, look, I'm coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. On that day, are you going to have any rewards? Are you living for today, or are you living for a future? Where's your, li where's your priorities lay? I'm going to end with a couple of quotes here that I just love, and it's concerning the kingdom principles that these guys had. John Watt Wesley, one of the greatest evangelists and preachers of the 1700s, said this. He said, I value all things only by the price they shall gain in eternity. I value all things by only the price that I shall gain in eternity. He had a kingdom focus. Listen to David Livingston. He's the one that blazed the trail for missionaries in Africa in the 1800s. And he said, I place no value on anything I possess except in relation to the kingdom of God. And then Jim Elliott was a missionary that took the, the gospel to remote Indian tribes and he lost his life. And he said this. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. These men knew the importance of investing in their future. They had prioritized their treasures. They weren't stingy but, stingy, but they were generous. And they had God on the throne of their life. Will you do the same? I'm going to ask you to stand and rise to your feet. Guys, here's the deal. Here's the deal. You know what? We hold on to everything that we have because it has us. We become slaves to it. And you don't understand. You have no idea. When you let go, when you let go and it no longer controls you, and you understand that part of building God's kingdom might be a delayed gratification for you, but you know what? To somebody else, it might be an immediate result right now. When you give to somebody else, you might be helping somebody pay their bills that can't afford to pay a bill. When you give to somebody else or this church, you might be giving to somebody that needs to go to that marriage conference, that their marriage is about to fall apart and they need to go. But you know what? We've taken that money. We've done that. Now, do you understand? Do you get that right now? No, you're going to get it later when you do it with the right attitude and the right heart. When you invest in the right thing, then you know what's going to happen? You know what? People are going to overcome addictions. People are going to let go of the junk that's going on. Marriages are going to get fixed. People are going to overcome things. But you know what? It might not be for you. It might be for somebody else. And when you understand that, 
when you understand that I have a giving heart and whatever I have is all God's and he can use it to change people's lives don't that seem like such a better way than holding on to the closet full of clothes that we have to all the extra toys that we don't need what if God wants to take your investment and translate it in to that person you've been trying to reach out to something to think about you know what this song that we're going to close with it's a song for those of you that don't know Carrie actually wrote this song and it's one of my favorite songs I can't even sit still when we sing it when it talks about you 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 it's not talking about God it's talking about you 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 are our crown it's that's why we do what we do that's why we open up the church. That's why we do this. It's for you. It's so your marriages can be fixed. It's so your finances can be put back right. It's so you can understand there's a better way of doing life. It's about you. And you know what? We cannot do it on our own. You are the church. And when you understand that, then you know why you're no longer coming in church just soaking it up, making it all about you. It now becomes something that you are doing for other people, that you're investing in others, and you're encouraging them, and you're fanning their flame, and you're a part of their life. That is such a better way than being just a selfish person that sits on the row and does nothing at all. It changes everything, doesn't it? And guess what? Jesus says, I'm coming back and I'm going to bring my rewards and your rewards with us. I'm going to give them out to everybody that's earned them. So you're going to have any rewards. Father God, we love you. It's in Jesus' name. And Lord, help us to have a kingdom focus. Help us to understand that it's about investing for the future. It's about investing forever. Lord, you can drain my bank account. I can be bankrupt. I can lose whatever it is. You strip me of whatever it is that you want, God, and I'm going to still praise your name and I'm going to point people to you because I want to have a kingdom focus in every single thing that I do. Lord, help us to be passionate people that follow you and encourage one another and pour our lives into one another and understand that when we give, we're not giving uh, just to let go. It's all yours anyway. It's all on loan. And God, help us to build your kingdom with it. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters loved by God